Cool. Welcome, everyone. Um, good afternoon for some. I think good morning also still for some. Good morning for you as well, still, Ella. Uh, good morning for me still, just about. Thanks so much for joining me. We were actually in a podcast together not too long ago. Uh, maybe our uh, Katrina, our community and event manager, is here in the chat. Maybe, Kat, it would be nice to uh, also post uh, the podcast link in the chat because it was a very interesting one about diversity and inclusion in the boardroom. Um, a practical note before we are going to start um, is that there is a chat functionality um, in the right corner of your screen. There's also a question section. If you have any questions during the webinar uh, or just any comments you'd like to make, uh, feel free to put them in there. Uh, we will try to tackle all the questions at the end or maybe if we see something in between that could be nice to uh, touch upon, then we will do so. Um, Quick intro of who I am. My name is Charlotte. I'm one of the founders of Equalture. Uh, we are a Dutch HR tech company. Uh, we build game-based assessments that are being introduced at the very start of the hiring process, preferably as a replacement of the resume, but unfortunately not for every company yet, mm -hmm. um, with the aim to make sure that candidates get an objective, um, uh, basically an objective method to show, hey, what am I capable of? What's my personality, et cetera. Um, Having that said, diversity, quality, and inclusion is something that is really at the core of what we do as a company, which also led to the discussion that we are going to have today. Now, before we are going to dive into um, the topic that we will uh, discuss today, um, Ella, it would be great if you can briefly introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Ella. I, as you mentioned, I have spoken to you a couple of times before this. Uh, so we got in contact initially uh, with Equalture because I was doing a role, a director of diversity uh, and in an inclusion role at a company, and we were looking at ways to overhaul our hiring process. So very uh, topical. But what I now do is um, I have a consulting company where I focus on providing uh, DEI consultancy to companies, to scaling companies predominantly, and there's some um, leadership culture work that I that I do as well. And what I tend to find is that DEI and management and leadership culture are kind of inextricably linked. So, uh, you know, you can't really handle one without looking at the other. <laughs> yeah, I fully agree. Thanks so much for the introduction. Hey, we already uh, were, of course, in here a couple of minutes before we started. Uh, and I already mentioned it to you up front. For me personally, uh, anonymized hiring, we called it blind recruitment here in the in the link, by the way, but that's for a good reason. So we will uh, come to that in a second. I find it always a bit of a tricky topic to talk about and to also express my opinion about. And the reason I, I, for that is, well, I think I'm in a quite a privileged situation. Um, I come from the Netherlands. I have a very wide sounding name. Uh, I think I went to a decent university, so I I, I tick the boxes, I think, to be quite privileged. Uh, so I would be curious mainly also to uh, if there are people here in the webinar today and, and would like to share some personal experience, uh, please feel free to do so, uh, because I value your perspective much more than mine here. Is that also how you feel about this, uh, Ella? Do you, do you get what I'm saying here? I do. And I think for me personally, I kind of straddle both in a way. So and what I mean by that is I have quite a white sounding name. I'm not white, but um, on paper, um, people might I, I've got a double barreled name, which in the UK has quite a kind of almost posh connotation. <laughs> That's not the reason I have a double barreled name. Um, I went to I went to some private schools and I went to a um, quite prestigious university. Quite a few of those things are almost accidental. Um, the reason I went to private school was because I got lots of scholarships to go to the local private school and that's the kind of route I went down. But I'm from quite a working class background. But on paper, to your point, my CV um, would absolutely get through the, the kind of generally biased criteria. Um, and on the other hand, because of my background and because I have working class parents and because I have black family and because I have um, siblings who've gone down a different route, I think I've got an insight into mm -hmm. 
that sphere where people have less privilege and on the other hand I feel like I I tick some of the the more privileged boxes as well yeah yeah I, I already mentioned it, of course, we call it um, blind recruitment uh, or blind hiring in the title. Uh, we actually did that for a reason because I think it touched upon the very first topic that might be good to um, good to clarify here. Uh, because what you usually see, I also did a Google search, so I found that the, 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 the search results for blind hiring slash recruitment were much higher than for anonymized hiring and recruitment. But why is it actually better to use the term anonymized hiring rather than blind hiring? Uh, put bluntly, I suppose, when we use blind in this context, uh, it's a kind of ableist language, basically. Um, but I think this is a really interesting topic because to your point, it's important that you you use that, that, that title for a reason. Um, it's the most widely used way of referring to this, this phenomenon that we're gonna talk about. And on the other hand, it's ableist. And so I think it's a kind of interesting insight into this wider kind of conversation that's happening at the moment around how ingrained in our language ableist vocabulary is to the point that we kind of don't even notice it. I don't know if you um, saw recently in the media, both Beyonce and Lizzo had to go back and change some of the lyrics in their songs yes. <laughs> recent songs and I would argue that they're both quite inclusive quite aware artists yes. um but it was only once they got a kind of bit of backlash that they went back and said oh, okay I need to change this and so there's an interesting conversation I think to be had here about how we just take this kind of language uh for granted and don't even it doesn't even necessarily occur if we're not from a disabled community that's that's impacted by it yeah yeah, and what I always find the most important thing here is obviously you will make, well, mistakes is maybe also a negative word, but there will be terms you're using that might not be the best ones to use. And I think it's always good to try to make people aware of it without blaming and shaming them for using it. So more constructive way of saying, hey, maybe this term is actually better to use. But it's good that we uh, that we clarify this. Uh, so we are going to talk about anonymized uh, hiring from this point onwards in the webinar. Hey, if, if we look at the concept of uh, anonymizing your resume, um, what information is most often being removed then from the resume? Or what, what would people in general advise you to remove from your resume? So the most obvious, I think most common things are your name, uh, any identifiable quote unquote um, details. So name, age, um, address, things like that. But I think that there's an interesting conversation again to be had around whether are we anonymizing the hiring process or are we just anonymizing the, the CV? Uh, so for instance, I know there was a law firm in the UK that that selectively uh, anonymized parts of the resume and part of what they anonymized was the university that people went to. So that's not necessarily one of the more common fields, but the reason they did that was that they identified that they had a problem with bias towards Oxbridge graduates and things like that. So you can yeah. also take out other details if you've identified that you've got a kind of a specific bias in, in your organization, but, but they tend to be the more common features. Yeah. Hey, and, and why do you think that um, companies apply anonymized recruitment in the first way? What do you think that they hope to achieve by implementing this practice? So I like to believe that, that intentions are normally good. And um, I think there are drawbacks to this um, to this approach, which we can which we can talk about, but I think the intention, or in my experience, the intention tends to be there's there's a realization that we are hiring in some form or other a homogenous group of people, whether that's homogenous from a kind of demographic perspective, whether it's homogenous from a people from a certain walk of life, um, and often that comes accidentally people like us hire people like us um, and and the the desire with 
doing some kind of anonymizing is, I guess, to disrupt those patterns that we've that we've fallen into in how we hire and, and who we hire. So uh, maybe as a, a, a small background story, uh, well, you know my founding story of this company, of course, but we, uh, so we started a couple of years ago and one of the reasons why we, well, the main reason why we started Equalture is to remove bias from the hiring process. And so I used to have a recruitment agency before I started this company. And I saw a lot of cases of discrimination, and I, but I think the one that stood out most to me was we worked for a very big Dutch enterprise. Of course, I'm not going to mention the name here, uh, but what happened is that um, I introduced them to a candidate of which I thought this is their perfect candidate. It uh, ticks all the boxes. And she was actually being rejected for the reason, uh, I know this is going to sound very harsh, but literally one of the people from the management team called me and said, we find her name too difficult here mm. to, so we are not going to continue with this candidate. I know you would, you would hope that that's not happening anymore, but we are talking about 2017, 2018, at least back then, comments like these were still made out in the open, which made me wonder, and that's, I think, the, the internal conflict that I have with um, anonymizing the resume. So I'm curious about your view on that is, what would have happened if I would introduce this candidate to the company with an anonymized profile? Then the candidate would be invited to a job interview and then they would still find out all the details. Would it really then make a difference? That's, I think, always the struggle that I'm having. What, what is your perspective on that? Yes, yeah, so I have the same struggle with this. My view is that, as with a lot of kind of DEI initiatives, which is often what anonymized hiring is is part of, is some kind of DEI initiative. This applies to lots of DEI initiatives, which is, I think, if it's used in isolation or to disrupt part of a process on its own, then frankly, it's probably not going to work. And so what sometimes happens, I think, is companies will say well we're gonna just blind the C the the cv so we're gonna anonymize the cvs i slipped into that there um and we've ticked that box great we've done what we could we tried and it's a kind of an excuse to say we tried to do a thing and we're just going to continue doing things the way that we've we've done them and so to your point i think it can it can work really well and there are kind of documented examples of it working really well but if it's if you're just taking the identifiable features off of a CV, but you're still sourcing in the same way, you're still doing the same interview stages, the same panel of people, you've not thought about your decision making processes and the bias that might be involved in them. Mm -hmm. You're not likely to get a vastly different um, result. You might get a more diverse pool of candidates further into the process, uh, but your decision-making process is still your decision-making decision process, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So basically what you're saying is it is a good first step, but if you do it in isolation without applying any other DNI practices to the hiring process, it's probably not going to have a, a, a real impact on improving DNI. Yeah, exactly. And I think it does depend. So interestingly, um, this kind of anonymized approach, one of the origins of it, or one of its first kind of use cases was in the symphony orchestra in Toronto. I don't know if you, if you mm -hmm. read about it. Yeah. And, um, you know, the way that they used it was to get people to audition behind a curtain and they would just decide based on that completely uh, anonymous audition. In a context like that, you have a one-step audition process the only thing you need to know is whether or not this person can um, play their instrument well enough to join your orchestra. And that's about it. And so anonymizing that part of the process works incredibly effectively because that's the only part of your process. <laughs> and yeah. So orchestras have quite low turnover and things like that. I think where you have, and, and I, this is true of a lot of companies who um I work with certainly is it's a little bit more complex than that there are more stages than that there's more 
um, sourcing processes that happen and there's the steps in the process. So I think if you're, if you have a four step process and you're anonymizing one step of it, that person's not going to be anonymous for long. <laughs> yeah. So you have to overhaul the whole, the whole thing in my view. Yeah. Yeah. Check. I'm going to park that for a second uh, because I, I would like to dive a little bit deeper into hey, what could you do then in addition to anonymizing resumes in order to make sure that you also make the 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 steps following up on that um at least more enabling for dni one other point that i wanted to touch up so that is my first internal struggle let's say like if it's uh how effective is it if you then in an interview actually see someone uh, so i think we, we we tackled that one the other one uh and i think someone in our community also asked a question about it earlier this week i'm going to make sure that i'm not um asking it the wrong way yeah um so he asked what can you anonymize still in your resume without erasing your personality basically uh, and that brings me to my second internal struggle with this topic like to what extent are we indeed removing our some sort of identity and uniqueness from a resume in order for the person evaluating the resume not to get biased when looking at you. It sounds a bit unfair, like it sounds a bit like the, the, the candidate needs to basically compensate for the bias of the recruiter. If you approach it very black and white, I know it's, a, it's, it's not that black and white, but what's your view on that? It's complicated. So I agree, I agree broadly with that black and white statement. It's almost like, a really blunt way of putting it would be you know you can't you don't want to have to pronounce my name so we're just removing my name <laughs> um which ultimately you know is more complex than that but I think this is part of why it has to be part of not only a bigger process but I think a larger kind of strategy if it can be a useful way of interrupting our biased kind of patterns. We all have patterns of thinking, we all have biases, we all have as humans, natural ways of automatically kind of quickly categorizing people. And when we look mm -hmm. at a resume, what we're often doing, if we're honest with ourselves, is scanning for those things. Oh, did you go to a university I respect? Oh, what grade did you get? Did you, did you work for a company that I think is a good company? You know, I, I'm making all of these kind of quick judgments Am I really going to the depth of, of what you did and what you achieved? Maybe, but I've already kind of made some of those prejudgments. And so yeah. I think if you anonymize parts of the process, you're removing my ability to make those judgments before I've seen the depth of, of your ability, which I, which I believe is a good thing. However, if all we do is interrupt that pattern and then we don't do anything to address my bias more deeply or I should say I should more say the systemic bias in the organization because I don't think it is a personal thing per se um then even if our hiring process is wildly successful and we manage to get a really diverse pool of candidates through the door and we change our diversity profile of the company those people are going to leave if we don't if we don't address some of the kind of deeper issues at, at play I think yeah, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think there is a big difference between literally removing any possibility to get biased uh, by looking at someone's demographics, name, university, etc., versus going back to the root cause of why do I even have that bias in the first place. Um, so would you say then that, um, for example, training should be something that in an ideal world, the training on unconscious biases, uh, forms of discrimination, in an ideal world, should everyone get that in the hiring process? Yes, all of the above. I mean, there's there's a lot of debate around unconscious bias training and whether it's effective and whether it works. Again, I think part of the issue is that often it's done in isolation uh, and the way that it's approached is, is kind of everybody come, do some unconscious bias training, right? we all become aware that we're unconsciously biased and go back to your day job. Yeah. Um, and so my view on DEI is that these things should be quite a holistic approach. Training is one rung of it. 
at disrupting and changing processes is one big part of it. It kind of, it doesn't sound like a very sexy thing, but I think fundamentally DEI for me is about changing processes Uh, and so there's a kind of changing attitudes there's a changing process systemic um processes there's a kind of educational piece I think that they're all pieces that should be part of the of the whole yeah yeah definitely hey I see a question coming in with regards to sourcing Uh, so I would like to I'm going to dive into that question in a bit um but if we first go to the stages following up on uh, screening candidates. So I think we all agree that uh, anonymizing resumes could be a first step towards the UNI, but then of course, following up on that, usually companies have either a phone screening or a set of interviews cases, and then they come to a final hiring decision. Mm. Um, you already mentioned it, unconscious bias training is not always that, maybe not always that effective. I think it has also maybe something to do with the fact that it should be tangible and practical. What can you do now that you know this? If we apply that to this conversation, uh, what are two or three very practical things we can do post screening to make sure that we extend the effect of an anonymized resume? Ooh, I mean, if we're talking about the kind of stages of the of the hiring process, I would say that what we've focused on broadly, which is anonymizing parts of a, of a resume, um, could go a lot further. So I think I think you're a big proponent of this. But first of all, I think there's a big question mark around whether we need a CV at all. Um, and if we don't need a CV, what about a C- what about a CV does work? What information do we need? What information do we want to be able to test? So I would say you can actually anonymize more about the process, get rid of the CV, um, get people to do tasks of some kind um, or get people to kind of fill in information about how they would approach different things. And so I think you can you can approach more steps in the hiring process than just the kind of resume screening step with this kind of philosophy the the caveat I would add is I don't think you want to make it too cumbersome I think there's a problem with making application processes really really uh time consuming for candidates especially if you know if I'm applying to 10 different roles that's really um that's a full-time job pretty quickly uh and I think you need to be aware of kind of um different people's needs and things like that but I think that that's ultimately a fairer starting point and then once you do get to an interview stage uh, I'm a big believer in in structured interviewing with scoring and things like that and the reason that I'm a believer in that is because I think it it's impossible to be 100% objective but what I've found is that even when people say they're not, they're going on their instinct <laughs> nine times out of 10 once you get to that interview stage. So if you can say, these are the 10 questions we always ask for this role and we're going to ask every single candidate the same questions, a lot of hiring managers push back on that and say, I just, you know, I get a sense and I go with my, you know, feelings. <laughs> um, but we know that's where the bias can can really creep in. Yeah. Well, it's actually, it's, it's, it's funny because it's, so I have to admit that, okay, we use our own games as a first step. So we have objective insights in someone, uh, but it was up until our people and culture manager landed her job here that we try to structure interviews, but I would not say that it was very successful. Uh, she really pushed for, okay, structure interview. It sounds mm-hmm. like a very big thing to do. I think maybe that's, I think that's one of the, re- the the things in general, right? With restructuring process, people also might fear the change in the workload that comes with it. Yes. Uh, while structuring interviews, actually, it's not even that hard to to do. Like usually you already have a set of questions in mind or at least information that you would want to collect during an interview. All you have to do is flip it around in maybe three questions, give it a one to five rating, and you need to make sure that people fill it in separately or mm. in the interview. So it's 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 not that hard to do so, but I always have the feeling with structured interviews that that people just fear the workload that comes with it. I think people fear the workload partly because they 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 assume 
what you're saying which is oh I have to do a whole new thing and mm-hmm. it's it's like well no I'm not saying you need to necessarily change the questions you're asking the questions you're asking might be great questions but what I am saying is maybe you've asked this candidate these three questions and maybe you've asked this candidate those three questions and instinctively you may or may not have been biased in how you decided whether to ask me the hard question or or not and that's impacted your decision making process and so if you already have a list of 10 questions it's just about adding some consistency and some a little bit more rigor to what you're already doing and then the second pushback pushback I sometimes get there with structured interviewing is it's not going to be conversational you know it's going to be awkward Mm. and yeah uh, again you know I think that there's a way to make it conversational there's a way to add transparency for the candidate and to say look it might feel a little bit awkward that I'm going to have um five key questions that I ask you but the reason that we do this is x we want to make sure it's a fair um process so you know I think it's pretty easy to make that quite transparent for the candidate so I find that a little bit of an excuse if I'm honest (laughs) I fully agree (laughs) (laughs) Um, Hey, I see a couple of questions come again, Uh, so I will try to make sure that we answer all of them. Um, A while ago, Sita, and sorry, I hope that I'm pronouncing your name correctly, if not, then uh, please correct me in the chat, uh, ask, uh, I would be interested to hear ideas on how you anonymize active sourcing. Well, sourcing is definitely not my cup of tea, Uh, so I would like to hand this question over to you. Yeah, tough question. So uh, it goes without saying that you can't really anonymize active sourcing. Uh, what I would say, though, is and, and active sourcing is a key part of hiring, whether we like it or not. If you don't work for Google or Spotify and you don't just get thousands of applications as soon as you put a job up, you're going to have to do some form of active uh, sourcing. And that's fine, I think. Um, what I would say is that or how I would approach this is to say we have a really clear process that process involves this game or this task or this exercise and then a structured interview stage and whatever that's our Mm -hmm. process and so we do active sourcing but we still ask every single candidate to still go through that process and when i do my game or my task or whatever you don't know who's done what and i I apply the same kind of logic to to referrals because people say yeah but you know referrals what about that and referrals can be bad for DEI for many obvious reasons but again I would say I'm not anti-referrals I would just say if you refer someone good they just don't skip the process and if they're if they're that good they should do well in the process right if the process is is correct yeah I think that's by far the most important thing we it's funny that you mentioned referrals because we well, not with every customer, but with a lot of customers, we usually have some discussions around referrals because what's usually the, 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 the gut response that they give is, but if we have a referral, then we are not going to let them complete your games because it's a referral, right? We put the effort in getting someone into the application procedure. That is not fair to let someone complete games before they go into an interview. And I think that's exactly where it's going wrong. So if you if you're going to change the differentiate the process based on oh this one comes in via a, a colleague friend whatever it's by default bias of course i mean i always indeed say to mm. customers like if it's a good referral then uh it's all good right then you will probably just pass and, and you don't be good if we believe that the game is a is an accurate test of the things we want to test because that's a question um, but as long as we believe that, then they should do well in the games. We, in my last role, because I overhauled the hiring process at the company that I worked uh, for, and we used to have these psychometric tests, which I hated. And I, I, I did a load of discovery with a load of hiring managers. And I was like, when do you use these tests? How do you use them? What are you? And, and overwhelmingly, I found that some people were using them. Some people weren't using them. Some people were using them selectively. So they put people through them but this was a fun one if they liked the person and they didn't do well on the test they disregarded the test yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Confirmation um, bias. <laughs> so so frankly the way that the test was being used was not was not fit for purpose so e- we either believe in the process we're using or we don't and if we believe in it then then everyone should go through it yeah yeah absolutely 
Um, I see someone, there, were, there is someone asking a question around a tech and uh, female versus male hiring. And I think there was also a comment from Thomas around this. Uh, what's interesting for you, Thomas, to mention is that um, something that uh, you might want to Google is called the gender confidence gap. Basically means that females are a bit more on average likely to underestimate themselves and males to overestimate themselves. What you see in assessments is we actually did some research into that recently. Is that with hard skill tests that are really you pass or fail, it's usually also causing a bit more anxiety that the drop off is usually a bit higher uh, than for people. Uh, if you have a soft skill test, it's more focused on potential. I still can't get my head around why that is, uh, but we did see it with our games also, that actually females have a lower drop off than men. I don't know exactly why, but it's, um, uh, it's I think, interesting to spot. Mm -hmm. However, it brings me to my question from Walter, because otherwise I'm going to forget about that. Uh, yeah, I, I find this an interesting one. Since the tech market in the Netherlands is 80% uh, uh, men-driven, well, I assume that's relatively the same for the UK, um, how can you anonymize your process without the risk of leaning towards a fully male team? So I think it depends on, I, let me go back to the beginning on this one. So I think that in overhauling our, our hiring processes, what we should be doing at each point is a, applying quite an experimental approach and quite a curious approach. And so I would say if we anonymize the process, let's say, and we're just getting men at the end of the process, there's lots of questions I would start to ask. What questions are we asking in interview? What things are we still valuing? Where is there still bias in this process? Um, you know, I've seen all kinds of things, all kinds of requirements and job roles I've had to question. There's a product manager role in my last company where one of the requirements was a master's in a STEM subject. And I was like, why? <laughs> yeah. Or it will be, you know, we need somebody because uh, the product that I that we worked with the tech product was in the kind of fintech space there would be things like they need ecosystem experience in the financial world and i was like do you know what that means for the gender bias that we're going to automatically have so i think i think the answer to that question for me is try anonymizing parts of the process if that's part of what you're doing to overhaul your hiring process and then still keep experimenting with it I think it's it's a mistake to say well we tried this thing and it still churned out loads of men so it didn't work I think it I think a better approach is to say what is still not working and at what stage do yeah. we still need to kind of fine-tune this yeah yeah exactly because I think that of course anonymizing CVs helps you in maybe not getting biased but if you I think that the question that Walter, Walter is asking also has a lot to do with getting a diverse group of people applying to your position in the first place. Yeah. And gen again, uh, I think the gender confidence gap comes in. Uh, I think if females read a job description and they uh, they think they only meet like four out of five requirements, then probably on average a female wouldn't apply. And if a man ticks two out of five boxes, then they instantly well, apply. It. <laughs> um, so I think it's a super interesting topic that you that you brought up. Like it's. With these kinds of things, uh, it's always super important to make sure that if you want to test whether, for example, anonymized recruitment is working, that you don't confuse that with something else that might be going wrong in your funnel. Uh, because yeah. it could be that a company may be saying, oh, we don't get enough females in our interview, so anonymized recruitment is not working. Uh, while it's, the reality is actually that their job description is leading to females exactly. not applying in the first way. I think you need to be really good at looking at each stage of the process and seeing where things exactly, not just how, but where things are going wrong. It might be that you have super diverse pool of candidates and no women are making it past the final interview. Well, that's a question of who's interviewing, what questions are they asking, where's the bias in that step? Or you might find that you're struggling to attract women as an example in the first place, in which case, job descriptions, employer brand, glass door reviews, you know, all of those things might be impacting. 
uh, yeah. before people even apply in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's uh, um, it, it's it's maybe a good summary of the topic that we touched upon before. Like, anonymizing resumes is just one step in the funnel. It's maybe a good step in the funnel if you want to specifically increase the conversion of diversity from applying to first interview, for example. But if you are looking for a different conversion to improve, apply to or interview to hire it, for example. Uh, exactly. then then this is not going to to do it for you uh, so i think that's uh yeah i'm a big fan of uh, i'm a big fan of data i think that with all these discussions it all starts with knowing where exactly in the fiddle it might be going wrong exactly uh i saw one more question coming in um let's see um it is uh can we trust uh, oh, can we have a selection process that minimizes uh, subjectivity? Maybe an assessment center, it might reduce or eliminate some biases. Well, this is for me by default a very biased question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I would like to end that one over to you. <laughs> okay. Yes is the short answer, I think. But the longer answer to that is I'd still be really... Um, I'd still continue to challenge yourself in how you're assessing and what you're assessing. I think sometimes if you take assessment centers as an example, they have loads of bias just baked into them. And they're even more dangerous because they think of themselves as objective <laughs> processes. So, um, you know, one of the mistakes I made early on in my career as a manager is we had a kind of a kind of graduate recruitment assessment center thing that we did and I ended up hiring a not very diverse group of of young graduates and, and part of the reason for that even though I like to think at the time I was quite inclusive <laughs> part of the reason for that was we hadn't designed the day in a way that would test for the right things and so actually the people who spoke the loudest in the room got noticed and the people who had already done certain research on the company impressed more. And there were loads of people. There was one young guy who'd started his own t-shirt clothing business who was super creative and I didn't hire him kind of even though I wanted to because he didn't perform well in the tests that I that we had created, but the tests weren't testing for the right thing. Um, and so I think you have to be really, really thoughtful because you can get yourself into a situation where you think you've de designed something fairly objective um, and you haven't. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's always, I think, the, the, the very big disclaimer when using tests in general. Uh, it's, of course, it's a more objective measurement than a human being judging your skills. But if you set the wrong requirements in the first place, you're not going to achieve any results with that. We see it a lot of times with companies that when they start working with us, they have like a list of 20 different things of which they think it's crucial to have it in order to perform well. If you just turn that list into an assessment without objectively assessing, is that list actually the list that we should be looking for? Uh, yeah, it's biased by default, right? It's uh, it's already going wrong at the start. So I... Uh, I fully agree. It can be beneficial. It can be also very, very dangerous if you start off with the wrong requirements to look for. Exactly. Hey, I have uh, one last question. Um, uh, sorry, I did not uh, communicate that in <laughs> up front to you, but it popped into my mind because we actually had a discussion, uh, where I had a discussion with my people and culture manager about this last week. Um, a bit off topic, but I think that a lot of people or a lot of companies that are trying out anonymized recruitment also just struggle with a diverse start of the funnel, uh, which again might have more to do with maybe the, the the places where you source people where your job advertisements are rather than anonymizing resumes. Now, a lot of people, of course, use LinkedIn as a main source to recruit people. Uh, my hypothesis after four years of hiring for this company is that LinkedIn also might not be the most diverse place to look for employees. Do you have any experience with alternative platforms for sourcing or advertising job um, 
uh, advertising job openings that might also lead to a more diverse pool in the first place? I do. Um, so in terms of kind of platforms, I have... I have used platforms that are specifically geared towards diversity. So for instance, there are some kind of networks. There's something, I think it's mostly UK based, but there's a there's a company, for instance, called BYP, Black Young Professionals Network, which is a mm -hmm. uh, a network of I think about 50, 60,000 black professionals looking for jobs in tech where you can post your job and that kind of thing. And so there are these kind of alternatives to LinkedIn for sure. Um, one of the things I found working in a kind of scale up environment is that there's still sometimes a struggle with brand awareness in those, in those yeah. situations. So what, what we found was because we were a fairly small company, um, we did advertise on, on some of those networks, but we just still didn't get many applications because you're competing with Snapchat. Right. <laughs> um, so that I guess is, is one drawback that continues to be one drawback but I think it's important not to just necessarily post on job boards like for instance BYP have a conference where you can go and speak and increase your uh, your brand awareness and things like that so I think you do have to think a little bit a little bit outside the box I suppose um, and the other thing I would say is I think it's possible to be a, just a lot more creative. What often happens, what I found working in a kind of high paced, high pressure tech environment is that people are always trying to hire yesterday. So they just don't, they, yeah. they, they don't really have time to, or they think they don't have time to go back to the drawing board or think about doing things differently or post in different places. So you get these defaults of like LinkedIn and personal networks. And that's kind of how it works. But I think if we're constantly thinking about hiring and we're thinking about it more proactively, then there are loads of uh, creative ways of, of um, approaching it. For instance, I once I once had a conversation with our UK kind of sales manager who I think thought I was just barking mad for saying this, but um, there are these young black, mostly um, young black guys who stand outside Liverpool Street Station in London and try and get you to sign up to some kind of charity and they are absolutely dogged in their pursuit they will not they will hound you until you sign up and I said to him that is a pool of future SDRs for you like they are enthusiastic they are determined they will like <laughs> you could go and chat to them you know so that that's just one kind of almost slightly off the wall example of yeah. how I don't think it necessarily has to be through super traditional professional routes always. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hey, uh, we got two minutes left uh, to summarize. So, uh, and please uh, let me know if I forgot any interesting points. Uh, as a starter, anonymizing resumes, it is a good start, but definitely not an isolation. So what you can do pre and post screening is pre screening look maybe for alternative platforms or ways to um, also reach a more diverse group of people. When it comes to sourcing and referrals, make sure that the process is structured the exact same way for everyone, regardless of whether it comes in organically or through sourcing or referrals. And then post screening, make sure that you always structure interviews maybe it's not structured from the start to the end there's always an intro and an outro but make sure that you at least ask the, the same three or four questions to everyone did i then uh, summarize exactly. the last Perfect. 45 minutes <laughs> yes <laughs> any last words that you would like to add to that i would just say so first thing i'd say is if you do those things that you just mentioned charlotte you're doing 90 percent more than most companies do <laughs> so you're doing a huge amount and it's actually fairly simple um and then the second thing i would say that i feel warrants saying is it's it's really important that you're working on your working culture and your inclusivity and um all of that side of things alongside your hiring process because even yeah. if you stop this kind of thing in the most in a in an incredibly successful way people will leave if you're not looking at, at your working culture as well. Yeah, definitely.
I think we should do a follow-up webinar soon on everything that happens after hiring because I think we approached the full hiring <laughs> funnel now. But indeed, it, 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 it's, it's even more important to make sure that if, if yeah, you can get a diverse group of people in, but if your organization is not set to that, and then, yeah, eventually it's, um, it's not going to lead to any results. So I fully agree there. By the way, Ali, I saw your last question. Oh, Kat, you already answered it. Yeah, people get the recording afterwards in this webinar. Um, cool, exactly in time. Uh, usually I'm always a bit, uh, <laughs> I always take a bit too long. Uh, thanks so much, Ella, for all the interesting insights. I love the fact that it's, um, I already mentioned it before, it's it's, it's difficult topics uh, and I always like to make it very tangible. And I have the feeling that we provided people with a lot of very practical things to do. So thanks so much for that. Um, and I will definitely contact you for a, a follow-up webinar soon. <laughs> Happy to rejoin. And thank you so much for having me. It was a great chat. I will hijack the last 10 seconds. Yeah, sure you go. Like so. um, we have a community which is called the Breaking Bias Community. I linked the thread um, in the chat if you want to follow us over there, um, share your takeaways and your insights. Also, people had such good tips on how to sort of help out that DNI effort with uh, um, blind recruitment. Uh, someone said that they always ask for the how to pronounce the name. So please share all of your um, all of your tips and advice there. I think we can all benefit from that. So and thanks for joining. All right. there. Thanks, Scott. And uh, thanks so much, Ella, again, and see you soon. And thanks everyone for listening. Bye. Ciao. Thanks. Bye.